Santa Rita Jail near Oakland, California is the fifth largest in America. Jail can be a world of violent gangs, hundreds of cliques that bring rivalries and vendettas from the streets behind bars. Here, San Mateo, San Daniel, gangster, you know what I'm saying? For many, life here means making a choice, join a gang or live without protection. You've got to run to somebody, because if you're out there by yourself, there are sharks watching you left and right. Jail becomes a proving ground, where old-time gangsters teach youngsters the ropes. It's mostly respect your race. You always try to stick with your race. Trying to stay a step ahead of these gangsters is the jail's gang unit, working to keep the peace in a world fraught with hidden danger. The majority of them probably do have weapons right now. It could be just a small razor blade stuck in the side of the cheek. It could be anything. It's a constant battle for control between the deputies and the prison gangs. This morning, in the staff muster room at Santa Rita Jail, deputies are arming themselves with flak jackets and non-lethal weapons, all in preparation for a shakedown. Just hours earlier, a deputy was attacked by an inmate. We're going to be going out to, uh, starting out with housing 33, we're going to be doing a shakedown in that housing unit. We did have a deputy that was assaulted this morning, as you guys know. We're just going to go back down there and reestablish some control and remind these guys that this is our house. Are we ready? Yep, we're ready. The assault happened in the early morning hours. During a routine transfer, an inmate saw his opportunity and struck. Jail is a world where violence is a constant threat. In cases like this, the response must be swift, measured, and decisive. And when deputies head out into general population, they have to be prepared. Inmates may resist or fight back. Each situation is different, and the jail must respond with the appropriate force and numbers. In the case of shakedowns, the element of surprise is key. Eastside, gentlemen, I need everybody on your feet. Do not go to your drawers. Get up, get dressed. Searches like these are a fixture of life here at Santa Rita Jail. But when a deputy is attacked, everything becomes more intense, and even the slightest show of defiance can get an inmate handcuffed. Turn around, put your hands behind your back. Stop. Let's go. The deputies search every cell and turn over every bunk. Their aim is to find contraband, like weapons, drugs, and alcohol. Already, the search is getting results. They uncover dozens of containers of homemade alcohol called Pruno. Throw some sugar in there and apple juice, and then just tighten it up, and it just starts fermenting. It's the catalyst for a lot of fights. People start drinking, and they get that liquid courage, and then a lot of fights break out. We do this on a routine basis. However, if you're going to be that, that housing unit that today you're going to threaten our staff, well, we'd move you to the top of the list. And today, they threaten our staff. Based on an assault that took place this morning, we move them to the top of the list. More than 150 inmates will be searched today, yielding gallons of alcohol. But the fight for control here is never ending, driven by one simple fact. This is the fifth largest jail in America. Almeda County's Santa Rita Jail, near Oakland, houses 4,000 inmates. 18 housing units stretch the length of the sprawling facility, a full half mile from end to end. There are two wings. The east side has protective custody units and minimum security dorms that house more than 300 inmates. On the west side, maximum security inmates are housed in double bunked cells and administrative segregation units hold problem inmates on lockdown 23 hours a day. As many as 60,000 inmates pass through here each year, creating an ever-changing inmate population, and the threat of violence is always present. Heightening that threat is a stark reality. 40% of Santa Rita's inmates come from Oakland, and Oakland has a serious gang problem. A barrage of bullets. Another deadly shooting in Oakland. We got the nine. Bring out the, other. the gangs here have contributed to a violent stretch in Oakland. More than 100 murders, four years running, and over 22,000 violent crimes. 
it all adds up to a steady stream of fresh arrests, headed straight to Santa Rita. The streets of Oakland set the tone here, and roughly half of the inmates have gang affiliations and often bring vendettas and rivalries with them from the street. Keeping control means constant vigilance that begins the moment inmates walk through the door. Deputy Terry Carson is working at the intake area, known as ITR. Have you been charged with any assaults on the police? No. Been charged with any assaults on other inmates? No. Carson interviews inmates to determine their criminal past, what sort of crime they're charged with, and what threat they might pose to other inmates. The information is used to classify inmates, and here in Santa Rita Jail, they are color-coded accordingly. Inmates given blue jumpsuits are considered medium security, posing a low threat. Yellow is given to those with heavy charges or a history of violence behind bars. Terrorist threats, okay. Each one of these represents the year that you did in prison. Red means an inmate is headed to protective custody or administrative segregation. You remember what the case was, a Central State Prison? Yeah. What was it? Barry, domestic assault, attempted murder. And when you were in San Quentin, how many points did you have? I made level four. You made level four. It is classification born out of necessity, an attempt to keep the peace. With so many gang members at Santa Rita, making sure rivals are separated is key. You see somebody that's opposite, say Sereno or Norteño, opposite of you. If you're Sereno, you better get off on that Norteño. That's all there is to it. That's the politics. And if you don't, we're going to do something to you. But new tensions between gangs can heat up at any minute. So the jail has created a special unit to track the ever-changing gang world. Terry Carson is part of the team, and so is Mark Schlegel. Together, they make up the gang classification unit, and their office wall is lined with one of the keys to understanding the gang world, coded artwork. You have a Kumi 415 over here. This is the Hells Angels. West Oakland. Oh, you got X4 North Day. Um... Hidden in the drawings are important clues of affiliation, of rivalries, and of potential conflict. It's all part of a story that translates to the history written on the inmates themselves. Tattoos. When these guys come across the counter, you'll see this same type of artwork on their skin. So they tell me a story. 14th letter of the alphabet, which is N, which stands for North Day. You'll also see 14 on white supremacist guys, but that means totally different. These guys don't put this stuff on a piece of paper or on their bodies without a reason or a story behind it. Decoding the story may be vital to keeping the peace here behind bars, but the gang unit serves an even greater purpose. They are building a record of each gang member, one that will follow them to prison or back out onto the streets. It's valuable intelligence that gets shared with corrections and police alike. But the challenge for the gang unit is daunting. There are hundreds of cliques and gangs in California. And on any given day, behind the walls of Santa Rita, many of them are represented. You got border brothers, you got everybody, Pisces, blacks, whites. If enemies are housed together, violence will follow. And right now, in maximum housing unit six, is a graphic reminder of that reality. Crime scene cleanup is already here, removing the remnants of a violent fight that started just hours earlier. Yeah, we had uh, just opened the doors for dinner feeding. An inmate ran down here from cell 14, entered the cell, attacked the other inmate, had a razor blade attached to a short piece of plastic, tried to slice him on the facial area. The injured inmates have been taken to medical, where the attacker may face charges for assault. It's still unclear whether the fight was gang-related. Here's a tear, and here's like the bottom floor. Yeah, so I still don't get the dice, so. though. The unit is under constant pressure to get it right, to decode thousands of pieces of intelligence and gang writings. It's blood, but it's What's blood. Four? four drops of blood. Yeah, but it's a one and a three. Yeah. So that's... Could be serenium. Serenium blood. Could be read into anyway. The challenge, identify the new rivals and separate them before things get violent. 
Santa Rita Jail near Oakland in California is the fifth largest in America. It's populated by some of California's most violent street gangs. Here, managing 4,000 inmates is all about establishing control. It's 3 a.m. on Friday night, and C-Team is working its overnight shift. Roughly 60 arrests have come in tonight to be printed, tagged, and processed. Let's go. We're going to search right here. Shoes and socks on this side of the blue line, my side of the blue line. Shoes and socks. Late in the shift, Deputy John White and the rest of the team are still on alert in an area where anything can happen. This is intake, transfer and release, known as ITR, and it's where arrestees become inmates. We're real careful at this point. This is our most dangerous uh, portion of ITR. We found anything from narcotics, knives, guns. We found everything in these cells after they leave them. The mood is always tense, but tonight has gone smoothly. But as every deputy knows, the later it gets, the greater the chance for trouble. We're roughly 10 hours into our shift right now. And every minute, every, every second, you have to be attentive to all your surroundings. Around the corner in the pat-down area, that vigilance pays off when an inmate makes a move at a deputy. The response is quick, measured, and designed to make one point clear. This is jail. We have to set the tone because they come across and they, they're not fully acclimated to being in custody. They don't realize they are not in control anymore. This is an individual that came across. Uh, he's intoxicated. He came across. Uh, we attempted to search him. He became combative. Um, so for our safety and for his safety, we went ahead and we restrained him, brought him back to the back. It happens every night. Don't kick me, dude. The alcohol does funny things to people, and unfortunately, this is where they usually end up. This inmate will sober up in a back tank of ITR. By night, it's a quiet corner for problem inmates. But in the morning, the mood changes radically as ITR transforms into the bustling hub of the jail. There are more than 30 tanks here, and on average, 400 inmates move through here each day. On busy days, that number goes as high as 600. Every inmate on their way to and from court, headed off to prison, being processed or released, comes through these halls. Gentlemen, make room. We'll be leaving shortly. Control is key here, but can prove difficult in an area where the deputies are outnumbered. You've got, you know, anywhere from 8 to 12 people on a shift working down here, but at any given time, you could be working with up to 300 inmates. It's 1.50. That means it's the last bus before count goes up. So let's get it done. Noise check it. With so many inmates to keep track of, on busy days, the system backs up. That can create tension, especially in the larger tanks, known as the bullpen. Typically, there are less than 20 detainees in here, when deputies fall behind, that number rises, and the bullpen heats up. On a hot day in the middle of July, you open the door, and it's literally like a sauna hits you in the face. You can feel the moisture in the air. It's kind of like when you open up your oven at home after you've cooked something. I mean, the more bodies that are in the, in the tanks, obviously, the hotter it gets in there, the more talking is going on, and tempers tend to kind of flare sometimes. It's all concrete, and you just sit in there and get hot, the vents stop blowing hot air, it's stanking, people fording and complaining. And next thing you know, somebody say something, and there it go, boom. It's like fire to gasoline. That's all it takes, you feel me? Open holding tanks are used at jails across the country. With a mixture of inmates all on edge, the atmosphere is tense and flare-ups are imminent. Away from the deputy's view, fights can break out at any moment and escalate as other inmates within the tanks become involved. Stand by, gentlemen. I'll be right back. The ever-present threat of fights keeps the pressure on the ITR staff. Inmates can't avoid the bullpen, so it's vital that the deputies get them out or back to the cell houses fast. Does everybody know the rules? As the day comes to an end, Deputy Scott Brandon moves more than 60 inmates back to the units. Right shoulder, right wall, single file line, the second rule. Shut up. With the inmates unshackled, there's one basic goal, keep them moving. You want to kind of keep them going in the same direction with a minimal amount of distraction. 
So if you can get them moving all in the same direction that looks like somewhat of a straight line, then to me, you're doing your job and you're getting it done. Because the whole goal is not to get into a fight with everybody you see. It just, it can't run like that. And the long and short of it is, these aren't children, these are grown men. So they're gonna act the way they're gonna act. For inmates, leaving ITR marks the end of a long day. But for those returning to cell houses like 34, the stress is just beginning. There are 328 inmates here, the maximum allowed, and just two deputies overseeing them all. During free time like this, known as pod time, it's loud, crowded, and governed by a code set by the inmates themselves. Inmates like Chris Card. It's mostly respect your race. You always try to stick with your race, you know what I mean? In this particular pile, we got the black hole where we're sitting at. From this bunk on down, we try to keep it all African-Americans. And toward the middle, the other diversities, they break up into different sects, you know what I mean? It's a separation that is stark and visible throughout the cell house, a racially divided world that inmates believe promotes the peace. Yet the racial divide here hides a more deep-seated separation. In this dorm, as with most cell houses here, the gangs are watching. Every table, every staircase, every phone is territory to be marked and held, much of it claimed by the dominant gang, the Nortinos, who have their own bylaws and codes. Rules followed by former gang members like Lucky. Everybody has a role, okay? It's like, it's like a body, you know? Like, everyone has a, a role in the gang, everybody does. Because no matter if you're way up here, or way down here, you're still contributing something. Say that there's a cell right here, okay? And this door opens 27 times a day. Me, my job, is to be in this cell and watch that door. And I jot down every time that door opened. Okay, that's my job. I'm part of something. I am doing something. When you're in a gang, in a Nortenio gang setting, it's by law you work out. If you don't, you will be disciplined and you'll be dealt with accordingly. That's the way it is. The gangs and codes here provide a structure, making it both a jail and a recruitment ground. Though inmates claim that segregation keeps the peace, fights do break out. And when this happens, it's each race and each gang for themselves. Me, my understanding, all my we gonna rock. If it go down, we gonna rock. Ain't no hands down, no question about nothing, man. If it kick off, man, we finna get on top of your helmet, man. Straight up, take no prisons, cause you ain't about to say, I'm not finna go home in no bag. Lock down, fellas. Let's go, fellas, lock down. After three hours, pod time comes to an end, and the inmates head back to their cells. The deputies walk through each of the tanks, where 36 men are double bunked behind mesh for the night. They confirm that all are present and accounted for, and perform a final spot check for any contraband. In dorms like 34, the numbers are heavily in favor of the inmates. So for them, lockdown means the night is just beginning and it's time for a cell house party, a feast of food purchased from the jail, complete with homemade alcohol. We can't let the police see this right here, man. This right here, man, knock you on your ass. <laughs> <laughs> tonight we make the gumbo, oysters, chicken, tuna, rice. We all put it, you know what I mean? We eat like kings in here. The city of Oakland, California, has one of America's highest crime rates, with more than 100 murders in each of the past three years. Police are investigating Oakland's third murder of the weekend. 40% of Santa Rita's inmates come from Oakland, and many of them are in gangs. It's the first stop for the accused on their way to trial. But with thousands of repeat offenders coming through the door each year, it also serves another purpose. Santa Rita is like a training ground for prison. On the jail's east end, dorm 34 is heading outside for a weekday ritual. Yard call. All 328 inmates are out together, and while it may seem like a time for recreation and games, there's much more going on 
than meets the eye. From the guard tower above, deputies Mark Schlegel and Terry Carson of the gang classification unit look on. Being able to sit up here and watch uh, people work out in the yard, you can see if there's tensions going on, who's got some authority and, and who the, uh, the bodyguards are. As you look down here, you can see that uh, all our northern Hispanics are down here at the end of the yard doing their workout program, push-ups and all the different types of exercises they got going on and then uh, talking about business at the same time. And they're positioned in certain places to keep an eye out of what's going on, you know? If you look down there, you see a guy, he's all by himself, standing by them pull-up bars right down there. See how he's standing there with his back to them guys working out? He's standing guard. The yard is all about territory. Different gangs carving up their own sections. Their yeah. owners control the handball courts. Black gangs rule the basketball court and other Latinos on the volleyball court. The yard has a strict set of rules set by group leaders. What you have is you have every faction out there. You have black, BGF, blood, crip. Uh, you got the northerners and the southerners. You got whites. I don't want to deal with nobody else, no other race. They're not going to get in my way. You're not going to step on my game. You know, that's it. You stay on your side of the grounds. I stay on mine. You cross my ground, it's over. You know, I will kick the yard off. I don't care. The rigid structure can be seen almost everywhere. And in a jail dominated by gangs, going it alone seems a difficult option. You've got to run with somebody, OK? Because sooner or later, you're going to get caught up in a situation where who are you going to turn to? Yourself, you know? Because if you're out there by yourself, there are sharks watching you left and right. They're going to come and try to use you. They're going to come try something to get over on you. That's how it works. And these guys, I would say a good majority of them probably do have weapons right now. It could be just a small razor blade stuck in the side of their cheek. Or it could be, you know, a toothbrush that's sharpened down in their sock. Uh, it could be anything. The threat of violence is just one part of life on the yard. For inmates headed for serious time, the yard is also a proving ground. And the lessons learned here are carried forward to prison, where the stakes are even higher. Many of California's most infamous prison yards are dominated by hardened gangs. And their clashes can be deadly. Even in this seemingly chaotic environment, the rules of engagement are strict and clear. Whoever's having the issues against each other, their channel or their shot caller will come and let you know, hey, back the f up for a while, we're going to go get off. If you want to get involved, let us know. You have to know who's who over or who's helping who out to know when it's going to jump off. But you can pretty much tell. I mean, you'll see it. You'll see the grouping up. You'll see everybody getting in position. And then next thing you know, it's mayhem. This riot at California's Pelican Bay prison probably started after tensions built between rival gangs. The conflict lasted for more than half an hour as corrections officers tried to regain control. In the end, more than 20 inmates were injured. The threat is always there. You can, you know, you could walk past some guy and look at him just like, you know, the sun be in your eyes and you look at him with your eyes like, you know, and then he'll run up on you. What the hell are you looking at? <laughs> nothing. Oh, I'm not nothing? See, and it could go just a domino effect of, you know, you're just saying the wrong things. The constant threat of violence has created a surprising shift. Gang members behind bars are turning their backs on gangster life. They're called dropouts, and they make up more than half of the inmates in protective custody here at Santa Rita. And Brian Curlis is one of them. Leaving gang life behind is no easy task. Curlis is in on a parole violation and is waiting for his sentence, which could mean a return to prison. He has a coveted job as a pod worker, but his criminal record makes him a three strikes candidate, meaning a new charge could get him a life sentence. And as a former gang member, the aggressive mentality runs deep. It's like now I'm a worker here. I tell people straight up, if you don't like the way I'm doing something, here's where I live. Come and see me at breakfast, you know? I don't have no problem with it. 
but at the same time, I don't want to get in a fight because I'm a three-strike candidate, you know? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> Curlis is walking a fine line. One slip could land him behind bars for 25 years to life. Santa Rita Jail holds criminals from some of Oakland's most dangerous gangs. For gang members, cell houses and yards are a harsh training ground where the inmates are indoctrinated into the gang code. For the deputies, keeping the peace is a never-ending challenge that requires more than just watching over the inmates. It requires constant surveillance and vigilance. And today, in Dorm 32, deputies Carson and Schlegel of the gang unit are following up on some fresh intelligence. Time for pod time, pod time. Lower tier, stay off the carpet. Upper tier, stay off the stairs. Once all the doors are closed, I'll flash the light. Again, this is pod time. Uh, apparently, about a week ago, from the information we're getting, they removed some of the guys that had a lot, a lot of say in this pod for the Hispan Northern Hispanics. They were taken out. And during that time, that kind of you have a void there. So there's always going to be a little power struggle within the group to say who's going to step up and call the shots. In the rigid gang structure behind bars, the shot caller is the one in charge. He runs the dorm, decides who fights who, but he also keeps the peace. Without him, even more fights could break out. So the gang unit is trying to figure out who is stepping up next. Figuring that out can be tough in this constantly shifting environment. One of the things that they do as leaders is to help train everybody else that's coming in here or, or make sure that people understand, you know, the structure in there. This is a county jail. Uh, when you're in the county jail, it's not like we're in prison where people are in there for, for years at a time. They're in for short periods of time, and so there's a lot of turnover and there's a lot of people coming and going. That constant turnover is one of the key challenges to keeping control here. Santa Rita sees nearly 60,000 inmates each year from all over Alameda County, so rivals from the street can easily end up housed next to each other, and that can spell trouble. Just as the jail is constantly looking to classify any incoming gang members, the gangs themselves have their own strict classification process, and just like the jail, it begins from the moment an inmate walks into a new cell house. When they come in, they have to check in, and when they check in, they have to give from the time they started coming into custody, the first crime that they ever committed to up until now, they have to list each and every crime that they committed, where they went, where they stayed, what state prison they were in, who this celly was, and all that stuff. So they have to have that track record there. It's like writing up their resume. These gang resumes are compiled on notes and are the key means of communication between the gang members. The writing on the note is tiny, called micro-writing, and some get moved throughout the facility and checked out for intelligence on new inmates. Information flows from one end of this facility to the other end of the facility on a daily basis. And the reason why it does that, and our central location, a point is, if they want to get information out, they can put it on laundry carts, they can put it on our food carts, and go back to our kitchen area, which our minimum inmates work. And if they want to get information for, say, housing unit seven, then the worker can come out there and put it onto a food cart or a laundry cart. It's an underground background check a poll taken of the inmates in the jail to see whether a new arrival checks out and can be trusted. If a new gang member checks out, he assumes his role in the gang structure. If the information doesn't check out, the consequences can be severe. And over in the muster room for the maximum security side of the jail, a unit is gathering for an urgent mission. A deputy has intercepted a note that contains hints that there's a weapon in housing unit seven and there's additional intelligence that an attack is in the works. One of the guys in B-Boy Pod is saying that they have a weapon, uh, one RB constructed into a tomahawk. We're assuming RB is a razor blade, so that's kind of what we're going to be looking for. Um, it could have been passed from, from B, obviously, anywhere in the house. We're going to do A, B, and C Pod as a search. In addition to rumors of a weapon in the dorm, the note lists the names of some Norteños housed there. I have a list here, A, B, and C pod of uh, some of the Norteño known and just known affiliates. This dorm is the target for today's raid. Finding the weapon is the mission. It could be tucked in a book, could be anywhere. It could be a mattress that's um, sliced open, stuck in the foam, you know, anywhere. So we want to make sure we do a good job, uh, especially with the, the Northerner cells. We'll just go in, you know, and do our job. 
Get it done. The team moves out to housing unit seven, where the inmates are already on lockdown. When the deputies arrive, the water is shut off to prevent anything from being flushed down the toilets. On your shirts, step out. An operation like this relies on speed, getting all of the inmates out of their cells before they have a chance to destroy evidence. Pull your shirt down, pull your shirt down, pull your shirt down. Those who buck the system are immediately removed. Once out, the inmates are patted down and then placed in holding areas as the search begins. Every cell is turned over in a search for contraband, homemade alcohol, anything that's not allowed. But the real focus is a potential weapon, an over in sea special attention. I found some uh, information on the guy that's housed here that he's good at making weapons. It's one of his specialties, I guess, that he, he called it. So this was my, my hopeful cell. I was hoping that we, it would be in here. Hopefully they didn't get rid of it. The deputy finds nothing. And throughout the rest of the cell house, the search yields contraband. This is a jail-made tattoo gun. But no weapons. Downstairs, they found more notes and more names. These show people that just arrived, it looks like. Uh, names and PFNs. It may just be the break the team's been looking for. A deputy takes the notes back to Carson and Schlegel of the gang classification unit for inspection. This is from CPOD. This was an FPOD. OK. The fresh intelligence demands immediate attention. This is kind of interesting. Look at the Decoding the writing is a tedious job, but buried inside could be more important information about gang members, weapons, and even new hits. OK, and we know this guy. It will take hours to pour over the micronotes. So back in cell house seven, the search for the contraband continues, and the deputies have had a lucky break. One of the uh, envelopes was addressed to a cell in F-Pod, cell one. Um, we understand there's a newer guy that's over there in uh, of the Norteño affiliation. So we're thinking that they may have something over there as well. The focus of the search narrows. Now, rather than searching an entire pod, the team moves in on three cells, and one of them is the real target. The inmates are quickly removed, and the deputies move in, checking mattresses, combing through books, but still no weapon. Out in the common space, a deputy spots something wedged under the television. It could be what they came here for. Yeah. A blade. Yeah. So we fit it up to slice somebody with it. Yeah. See? The dangerous weapon is removed from cell house seven. And for now at least, a possible gang hit is averted. Another small victory in a world where the threat of conflict is constant. Over in protective custody, Brian Curlis still marks his days at Santa Rita, trying his best to stay out of harm's way in a world of violence. Curlis is on a parole violation, but has turned his back on gang life. It's a decision that makes him a constant target, even here in protective custody. I don't think you're any safer here than you are on the main line. At any time, anything you do, you know, you sit at the wrong table, you use the wrong shower, it could get you hurt. Gang members despise dropouts. They are traitors of the highest order. That makes them targets wherever they go, especially behind bars, where gangs set the unofficial rules. While gang initiation is often violent, getting kicked out is even worse. <laughs> It's called a removal, a quick but violent act where a gang member slices another in the face with a weapon. The slice leaves a permanent mark and lets other gang members know that the target is a dropout, what they call no good. I've seen people 
get their face sliced open, have their ear knocked off all the way across. To be a dropout, you know, it's like you're hated. You're hated a lot. People literally 100% want to kill you. By being placed in protective custody, the dropouts are already marked by the red jumpsuits they wear. So far, Curlis hasn't been attacked, but anything's possible in jail. It's something you gotta deal with, you know? As you get older, you get wiser. If somebody starts assaulting me, I'm gonna fight back, you know? I'm gonna defend myself to the fullest. You gotta be stronger than the average person around here. Curlis will soon find out his sentence. Until then, he's constantly on edge, always looking over his shoulder. Santa Rita Jail is a revolving door for some of Oakland, California's most violent gangs. An estimated 30,000 people with gang affiliations come through here each year, and deputies are always on their guard, always looking out for conflict. In intake, transfer and release, the day is just getting underway. A dozen deputies start their daily routine, moving 200 bodies through these halls. Gentlemen, we're gonna move down to the nurse. Remember our discussion. The quicker you guys do it, everybody cooperates, you get through fast. Terry Carson of Gang Classification is on his post at the front end of the system, screening the new intakes, trying to figure out whether they have gang affiliations and where to put them. Throwing these street gangs? No. None? Any tattoos? No tattoos. Nothing. Nothing on your back? Nothing. The process of classification here is never ending. It's a process designed to keep rival gangs separated and violence from breaking out. Despite their best efforts, clashes can happen at any time. Clashes that escalate as staff step in to break them up. Out on the maximum security wing in housing unit four, a deputy has been caught in the crossfire while breaking up a fight between three suspected gang members. The inmates are already on lockdown as an investigation is underway and the pod is littered with the remnants of a brawl. The deputy on duty is still shaken after having a chair thrown at him. A search of the pod after the fight, uh, all inmates were searched and jail made uh, weapons were uh, located within the pod. It makes you think uh, when you go running in there to protect these guys, if somebody's gonna stab you and or hurt you also. It could be a trap, you never know. In an isolation cell, the inmate who threw the chair is still being questioned. Threw a chair, I threw a couple of chairs actually. To uh, protect yourself? Yeah. The deputies suspect that the fight was between rival gangs vying for power in the cell house. Since a deputy was involved, the punishment is stiff. This inmate may face new charges and more time for assault. Sign me a charge, Yes, you are. New charges are something that every inmate dreads. They can mean more time behind bars. Former skinhead Brian Curlis is trying to steer clear of getting new charges of his own. He's shipping out of Santa Rita, headed back to prison. Leaving jail behind means returning to a world where the convict code runs even deeper. As a gang dropout, he'll face challenges daily. But as a three strikes candidate, those challenges could have serious consequences. I have too much violence on my jacket to where if I even slap somebody in prison for mouthing off at me, I could do life, you know? But I'm gonna drop out right now. I've gotten out of it because what am I gonna do? I can't, I look back sometimes and I think to myself, man, I've screwed up. Never mind, hold on. I screwed my kids up going through this and it's just crazy, you know? 
So. <clears throat> Curlis's sentence is 250 days. 250 days to toe the line and steer clear of fights. If he fails, it could mean a life sentence. The prison bus leaves, signaling the end of another day. Back in the cell houses, the evening brings with it a familiar sight. Deputies have formed a squad and are making their way across the yard. It's another shakedown, another attempt to remind the inmates of who's in charge. The battle for control between gang members and deputies never ends. Join cops patrolling the drunken states of America in a brand new look at US binge drinking next Thursday at 9. Stay tuned for Seconds from Disaster.